Welcome to Investing Insights, partnered by Right Property Group. This is your host, Phil Tarrant. Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to our education series uh, with the guys from Right Property Group, uh, Investing Insights. Thanks for tuning in. Phil Tarrant here. I'm the editor of Smart Property Investment, and uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our two regular co-hosts of our education series, uh, Victor Kumar and Steve Waters in the studio. How are you going, guys? Good, mate. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming in this month. Really enjoying recording these uh, this education series. Uh, so this is now onto our fourth episode. We're just coming to the backside of January now and um, straight A's just around the corner. And uh, I hope everyone tuned in to our last episode where we spoke about uh, goal setting and uh, sort of evolving your mindset for the, the coming year. So we're now uh, nearly a month into the new year. And uh, hopefully a lot of our listeners are supercharged and uh, energized uh, driving forth with their 2017 plans. I know, Victor, you spoke last time we got together that you generally use the period between Christmas and New Year's to do your sort of goal setting for the year ahead. So how are you tracking now, mate? One month in. Oh, pretty well. Um, pretty well, Phil. Um, uh, I've already, as in every year, I hit the ground running. So I'd normally do my uh, goal setting between uh, Boxing Day and New Year's Eve. And on New Year's Day, I've already started to implement. And, and something as simple as sending an email to all of my property managers saying, you know, put my rents up. Oh, can I put my rents up? Uh, because, you know, that that's a, a, a positive step towards my uh, portfolio. And you've already done that? I've already done that, yes. How did that uh, resonate with, with your with your property agents? Look, some some come back and say, no, you try this every year or you try this every six months. Um, quite he a sends few. a card, like Merry Christmas. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah, <laughs> put my rents up. <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> and most most actually just say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll send the notice to the uh, tenant. Okay. It's good. And the other two topics that we've we've focused on so far uh, in our education series, and I do recommend you go back and listen to them. If you haven't even you have listened to them, the way that we try to put these together is that you can keep going back and hopefully pull something out of them every time that you really listen to them. So our topic number one, episode one, was the 11 things successful property investors don't do. Bit of a tongue twist. I'll try that again. The 11 things successful property investors don't do. And our second episode was around debunking the most popular property myths. So you should be able to see them on the uh, the feed that you see right now on, on site. Or if you're looking at this on iTunes, you'll see the uh, other episodes there. So do tune in. But um, this month's episode, and this is something which I think all property investors at a point in time uh, or regularly will question themselves over or will question their uh, A team, the people helping them build their portfolio uh, around the type of properties they're buying. Now, the question is, or the, the, the sort of topic that today that we want to cover is units versus houses. So do I buy a unit? And do I buy or do I buy a house? Now, before we get into that, I'll sort of preface this with a disclaimer around, you know, we're just having a general conversation around this. So look, hopefully you learn something from this conversation. And we're going to be talking about sort of specific strategy oriented stuff here. So um, this is just general information only. But uh, my recommendation is to speak with your uh, relevant property expert, whether it's your buyer's agent, your accountant, mortgage broker, financial planner, around these type of things. But uh, with a sort of a quick disclaimer aside, I'd also preface this also with, we're assuming here when we talk about houses versus properties, but it's probably connected as well, Steve, that whenever I get asked by someone, do I invest in a house or a unit? My initial response would be, don't worry about the type of property you're going to be buying. You need to be thinking about where you're buying first. And that is where you should be starting. I think absolutely. So where you're buying and what do the numbers look like? You know, probably one of the very first questions or statements that we get a lot of the time uh, from people is, you know, just don't buy me a unit, don't buy me a townhouse, don't buy me anything that's got a body corporate or a strata fee attached to it. And you know, the, the quick question from us is, well, why? You know, what, what gives you these preconceptions? And usually it's because they've had a bad experience or they know someone who has and that the costs have been way too high. So yes, they're looking at it from a numbers point of view, but they're getting emotionally attached to something that probably hasn't worked for them because they bought the wrong thing to begin with Mm. or the wrong type of property for their situation. So when you're thinking about areas to buy, obviously that's all driven by fundamentals and your investment strategy and where you are in terms of maturity of your portfolio. So you might be buying in areas which are offering capital growth. You Mm. may be looking for areas which are offering yield. Hopefully, you're looking for both of those. But this is going to influence where you buy. And once you have that determination of here are the areas which are going to provide or add to my overall portfolio and a strategy I'm going is when you start going down to more of a micro level, start looking at particular types of houses. And this podcast today, we're going to cover a whole bunch of things which are related to do I buy units and houses? And some of them is going to be sort of body corporate concerns. It's going to be an insurance component of it. It's going to be the cost to operate. It's going to be the cost to purchase potentially the cost to construct if you're going down that path. But um, 
you know, there's also a renovation component. So I, I hope to, to touch on all those things today. But I think maybe a really good way to start and, and in conjunction with this conversational dialogue we're having right now, Steve, is it's pretty much matching the property with the area and the demographics of that area. And that's going to be pretty much one of the key things that's going to determine whether or not you're buying units or houses in a particular geographic area. Yeah, absolutely. And just probably one other um, reason as to buy one or the other, if you're just starting, is how much capital Mm. that you're starting with. Obviously, if you've got limited capital, then you probably are going to go to something cheaper, which is for the most going to be a unit or a townhouse as opposed to a house on on a larger block of dirt. But I think if we look at the... The, the, you know, maybe the pros and cons of both of units or body corporates and, and houses so usually units or townhouses or villas are usually based on better infrastructure so they're on the, the shopping precincts they're near the stations they're, they're near the transport hubs uh, and that's because zoning is different closer to the the cbds or the, the centers of of particular, uh, particular districts and usually the houses are out in the burbs they're in the they're in the suburbs and if you're lucky enough to have a house in that precinct well yeah, you're probably sitting on a on a gold mine in the future. Usually, the people that are looking to to reside in a unit or a townhouse, you know, that's what they're looking for. Well, one or two reasons. I'll come back. One or two reasons. One, that's what they're looking for because perhaps they've got no transport, so they need to be living near it. Or it might also be an affordable thing because an affordability issue because body corporate or strata properties are usually cheaper to rent than the houses. And then, of course, there are those that are always going to want to live in a house because they might have a larger family. You know, several cars, whatever it may be, and they need to accommodate that as well. I think you know it's it's important to recognise that uh, when you're talking about units and townhouses, that we as investors are not going to live in there. So don't don't aim for the flash stuff where it's got the gyms, the pools, the the um, you know concierge downstairs. That in my mind uh, would be the wrong type of unit to buy. Uh, because you've then got the associated costs with that, which pushes your strata fees up, which then, whilst on the on the gross rents and the gross yields, it's it's um, uh, adding up. But when you add all of those extra costs in with the strata and and of course pools that need to then be the um, uh, repaired at some point in time or serviced, um, uh, gyms that uh, equipment need to be replaced, uh, it certainly blows your holding cost out, and therefore a on paper good investment then becomes a bad investment. And that's what most people tend to feed off of someone having that bad investment because. They haven't looked at it in its entirety. They've just looked at the purchase price and and saying, okay, it's going to get me X number of dollars of rent. So therefore, in inverted commas, it's positive cash flow. They haven't looked at every single expense on that particular unit. Yeah. So so let's uh, a bit of a case study, Victor, and let's talk about Campbelltown. I know you you know Campbelltown well. You've been very active out there, probably for a good decade or oh, so. Oh, more than a, little, a decade. A little bit longer, now, fifteen yeah, years, almost, yeah. almost eighteen years now. And and you've seen two cycles through there, right? Absolutely. Now. And yeah. um. Uh, Campbelltown 18 years ago is very different from Campbelltown today. Very you, much so. Um, I use the term gentrification, but um, you've got areas of Campbelltown now outside the CBD, which are very affluent. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also have a very much a working class housing commission orientated component of the Campbelltown as well. So it's a microcosm of what is Australia mm. today. And I remember I last year uh, I was on um, uh, the Sky TV, Your Your Money, Your Call, which you do quite regularly, Steve. And yep. a question came in from a guy from Campbelltown and and... He said that he bought an off-the-plan apartment in Campbelltown in the new area. I can't remember the exact name of it. And he was saying, uh, should I hold this property or should I sell it? Because he, he thought that it was probably worth less than what he purchased it for off the plan. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember the conversation we had around that was matching, you know, what, why is anyone going to want to rent a two-bedroom apartment in Campbelltown? When you look at the demographics in Campbelltown, it's a very family oriented area so when you look at purchasing properties in Campbelltown this can be anywhere but the dynamics are the same how do you go about matching the investment for the people and it's a very interesting yeah, point it, it is yeah. and, and you've got to look at what's the what is the jobs situation in that area what what sort of employment do people have uh, and over the years even if you're talking about particularly Campbelltown in New South Wales it's um you know the job situation has changed immensely when I started investing there it was Campbelltown was considered, even from a lending point of view, as the start of regional area. 
So your lenders were only willing to give you a 70% so, or even 80%. So they were not going to 90% in, in the Camelton area. So I'm talking back in 1998. If you, if you fast forward that to now, uh, it, it is considered one of the, uh, one of the uh, employment nodes of, of the state. Uh, and it, it is becoming a go-to place because of the change that's happening in the demographics. So back in 1998, perhaps your brand new apartments weren't the place to, to invest. Uh, certainly the old ones, and in fact, the first investment property I bought was in Campbelltown. It was a, a two-bedroom unit. Bought that for 70000 rent was uh, 130 a week. So, you know, couldn't fault it, but it hadn't moved in value for quite a while. And uh, it was only when the demographics started changing uh, that the value started moving. Um, so that's, that's what's caused the uh, shift from people living in, uh, in, in, um, in houses to more... Uh, a, a sort of a metropolitan type of living that's that's starting to develop in Campbelltown, and and there are other areas in all of uh, all of Australia that that the similar things are happening. But it's not an overnight thing. You need to be able to look at the council plans and and look at what's um, the um, uh, the plan, the the number of developments that are going to happen, and uh, how easy is it to travel, both to airport, to the city, to your employment, uh, which would then uh, start determining whether you will have a more stable tenancy or as where most areas start, they'll have transient tenancies which um, then don't quite make them a good investment. Mm. And and you speak often about this uh, where there, there is a sort of adage that you should always invest within five to 10 kilometres of the CBD centre. Mm. Um, and you've spoken about this before on Smart Property Investment where the way you conceptualise that is that that doesn't mean five to 10 kilometres of your 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 postcode. It's about investing within five to 10 kilometers of a CBD. Now, let's say it was Campbelltown. Campbelltown mm. is its yeah. own self-sustaining geographic area, just like Parramatta, just like Blacktown, just like Penrith. Mm-hmm. So within the belt of five to 10 kilometers of Campbelltown, uh, that pretty much encapsulates all of Campbelltown. You're starting yep. to, to reach towards, I guess, your Pictons and your Candoms if you mm-hmm. go out that far. But within that, you have a breadth of different types of properties. You Absolutely. have houses and you have units. Yep. So within that area, that self-contained area, there's people who are going to want to live and rent two-bedroom apartments, three-bedroom apartments. You're also going to have people who are going to want to rent four-bedroom houses or five-bedroom houses. So Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, if, we, if I go back to what, what Steve said earlier, um, uh, the um, best locations for these units are near infrastructure, so railways, shops, all that sort of stuff. So if you look at, uh, and, and uh, since we're talking about Campbelltown itself, if you look at that demographic, the ones that rent out really well and the ones that push up in value quite significantly are the ones that are pretty much very close to railway lines uh, and, and very close to the shops. Mm. The ones that are further out, um, they they have a higher turnover in terms of tenancies and, and certainly um, they aren't going up in value as fast as the ones that are closer to the infrastructure. Mm, interesting. So so these dynamics are the same across Australia, across Australia ir- irrespective yeah. of, mm. of whether it's Camberthown or Penrith or, or up in Brisbane or Melbourne. So if I'm thinking about do I buy a unit or a house, and this goes back to a point that Steve made earlier on, a lot of it's going to be dictated by your budget. So if mm-hmm. you identify an area which shows the fundamentals that property prices will go up and there is a number of those and we've spoken about them for a long time it's around population growth wage growth investment in infrastructure accessibility to infrastructure etc etc we've spoken at length about it if you can identify those reasons so the first point of call is household unit how much money do i have to spend absolutely it comes back to your capital right so you know just like steve said earlier you know if you've got a small amount of capital to get started Try and find a, a unit, townhouse, villa close to infrastructure that isn't costing you an arm and a leg to hold. So the strata fees are fairly low and the building itself is in, in good nick uh, and, and start there. It's better to be in the market than, than waiting on the sidelines, uh, you know, watching everyone uh, else making money in property, mm. whereas you just, just um, uh, in inverted commas, you know, paper trading in, in that sense. Because you'd have to be in the game to actually win it. Okay, so so point number one, point number two, and you mentioned very quickly was cost to operate. So yes. what's cheaper to hold outside of the mortgage? Mm-hmm. What's cheaper to hold a house or a unit? Look again, it comes back comes back again to looking at the, all the outgoing costs. So if you have a, a unit that's got these um, uh, you know gyms and and concierge and all that, of course they'll be more expensive to hold as compared compared to the house. But a lot of people sort of uh, say that you know with a house that I have cheaper cost to operate. 
uh, that might not necessarily be true. So if you look at uh, a unit itself, uh, you're paying a strata fee. Part of it is your sinking fund, uh, and part of it is uh, your admin fund, which is, which also carries the insurance that you pay for the for the building itself. Uh, so when you really do uh, dollar for dollar uh, in that sense, they pretty much go hand in hand, right? I guess the um, argument could be that the houses would go um, up in value faster because it's got a bit of land content. Yes, they may, but if when the houses do go up in value substantially, the units do follow because then that's the next cheapest thing, and um, you know people need to buy something or, or live somewhere. So naturally, the demand for that increases as well, particularly with something that would have a lower uh, strata cost, and it'll naturally follow the the growth of of houses. And in terms of insurance, Steve, with units versus houses, so Victor mentioned that the actual building insurance is covered as part of the body corporate fees. So if you're an investor, you have uh, just contents insurance within a unit. And landlord, yep. And landlord mm-hmm. in- insurance. And we're talking sort of 300 odd bucks for a unit. Roughly, a depending, year, on, yeah, depending on where it is, who you're with. But I think um, in terms of insurance, people have got to be really careful when they're buying a, a unit or a townhouse that has a body corporate or a strata attached to it to know what sort of title it is. Is it strata title? Is it community, community title? title? So as an example, community title is more about uh, well, you're going to have to pay the building insurance as well, even though you already contribute to the strata fund in inverted, inverted brackets, commas, um, <laughs> you still got to pay your own landlord and you still got to contribute towards building insurance. So yeah, that can be a trap for new players just thinking that, well, because I play strata, automatically the building insurance is covered. So be very, very wary of that. But just coming back a few points in terms of houses versus you know, units or townhouses, villas, I think people have just got the wrong thought process around the whole the whole argument so to speak it's a little bit like you know city or country buying yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is a whole nother podcast perhaps there are there is a time and a place to buy either type of property um, and there needs to be a, an exact reason for it so if I look if I look at us as we create the portfolios for our clients we're looking to have some diversification not just in terms of property type but area and, and fundamentals and so on and so forth often the units, and this is not me supporting them and saying you should go out and just buy body corporate deals, uh, but if we look at some of the positives with a strata titled property, is that usually the cash flow is actually considerably better than what a house is. Now, so if you're on a budget in terms of entry costs, capital required, and potential holding costs, and maybe a unit in a well-located area or a townhouse, whatever it may be, is the place to go. Now, what it also does, having better cash flow, is it helps you balance the books as you create your portfolio, so your cash flow essentially. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons that you want to do that. One is because you don't want to be having a hand in your pocket all the time to support your, your properties, but it also helps with your serviceability. Um, and if I look back at the, the last couple of properties I've bought recently, they're both townhouses, uh, and I did that deliberately. I, and I, yours is a fairly mature portfolio as yeah, well. So, and yeah, exactly. So it's, it's well worth taking every property on its own merit. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you should if you're just after cash flow, but you should buy units because there are some things that you need to look out for. And when I say units, of course, I'm incorporating villas and townhouses. There are some things that you need to be very, very aware of it. One is that you are quarterly going to be paying towards the sinking and admin fund to, to own the property. You can't make a difference to the facade of the property. So if, you, if, you, if you're a renovator, uh, just know that you, you can only renovate inside and then you're going to need strata or body corp permission to do that unless you run the, the gauntlet before you do it. Uh, houses, on the other hand, they're going to cost you more to hold, more often than not. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can make a difference to the to the facade uh, by renovating it outside. But there's also some other negatives with houses too. You've got a bigger land tax component. Um, there's more of a negative cash flow. Usually the uh, purchase price is much higher. The, pur- the entry cost, mm-hmm. that's yeah. right, the entry, the capital required is a lot more. So we're actually very, very, very big advocates of actually having a balanced portfolio in terms of asset type. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know it's it's important to point out, right? I, I started my uh, with my first investment as a as a unit, uh, whereas Steve, you started with a house. house. Yeah, yeah, in two different areas, but similar demographics, and both have performed just as well when you give it enough time. Well, that's the argument. See, people, and there are some advisors out there perhaps that just say, you know what, we never, ever, ever touch a unit, never touch anything with body corporate, just buy house and land, house and land, because the argument is it's the the house, the dwelling depreciates in value, and it's the land that actually goes up in value. And on the surface, that's a a fair comment. And 
but coming back to the to the argument, what's the cliche? You can't can't create new land. Is yeah, they're not yeah. building any more yeah, land. I think right. it is. But if I look at the pure numbers here, and this is this is all based on if you buy the right unit or townhouse mm. versus a house and I'll take my very first house as an example in that area I used to walk past all the units in the townhouses and say you know what I'm not going to buy them because it's the house that goes down in value and it's the land that goes up so there's no land really attached to the unit so I refused to buy them and yeah my properties went very very well and they they did well cash flow wasn't as good as the units but it was about three years later that I thought you know what these have all gone up in the same fashion the percentage growth was the same but the dollar value obviously was a, diff- a bit different because they're a cheaper mm. product mm. yeah and Fast forward again, those very units, and this is going back to the year 2000, 2001 or thereabouts, the units that I used to walk past were 60, 65, $70,000. Those very, very same units are now selling for 340000 In fact, you've got a couple in, in the complexes. Yeah. yeah? Yet the cash flows. I'm Mount talking about Mount Druitt. Yeah. 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 Now, and I'm not saying that's the only area. Obviously, Campbelltown's yeah. the same. In fact, Parramatta's the same. Brisbane's the same. Mm. Yeah, everything's the same. So I think being very, very particular in what you buy and how you buy it, of course, is is very, very important. And that also comes down to you know, if you're absolutely hell bent on buying a unit, as an example, make sure that the interior size is is able to get finance. Yeah. yeah as an yeah. example. And it's it's really important that uh, you know when we look at it. Uh, uh, if you're buying a unit, um, you're looking at it from from a logistic point of view. That uh, you know that's not the only block of units in in all of town. Uh, so there you know there has to be a demand for it from a tenant's point of view. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And uh, if you come back to uh, you know how I started and how you started, Steve, uh, you bought a house because you had a bit more capital. I had uh, limited capital, so I bought a unit which was you know seventy thousand, so very limited capital to get started. And um, uh, comparatively, at that time in 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 that area, houses were selling for around the two hundred to ten mark. Mm. Um, so I couldn't get into houses. So by default, I started from a unit and then I leveraged off that to get into a house uh, at a later stage. Both the houses and the units have performed just as well, like I said earlier, if you give it enough time, provided, of course, you've... The fundamentals you, The correct. fundamentals yeah. are addressed to begin with. Mm. The, the, I think this is a really, that was a really good dialogue because what I would take out of it and to summarize it is that the property needs to be fit for purpose now what does fit for Correct. purpose mean it's it's um, it's related to demographics of the area and the type of people who are renting properties in those area point number one point number two where does it fit within your portfolio so is it your first purse first purchase and therefore you might be looking for capital growth or is it something which might be your fourth fifth sixth property it might be looking for a cash flow play so that's going to determine where you are another purpose how much money can you borrow so if you have limitations or restrictions about your borrowing capacity that's going to determine and dictate the type of property that you buy the the, the point that i would make is that um and i think investors need to be thinking about this is that our the, the makeup of australia is evolving rapidly we are very fortunate that as a nation we are very uh we have a very healthy economy and it seems to be going to continue we, we haven't had any real negative growth for, for well over two decades um and that's been great for property investors and house prices uh we're a very attractive nation and we are essentially becoming and we have been for for many many years a, a nation of migrants and you know a lot of people are coming to Australia to live, and I can't remember the exact demographics, but I think it's sort of 40 plus percent of all Australians now are born outside of Australia. Now, if you think about the type of people who are choosing Australia as their new home, you need to be thinking about how they typically live in their mm. their, their previous yep. mm. um, uh, country and the style of how they want to live in the future. Uh, and you're seeing now is that the attractiveness of apartment living is is rapidly rising. A lot of that is originated because of the type of people who are now choosing to live in apartments. So these are all the things about fit for purpose yeah. that you need to be considering who's going to want to rent this property and therefore you should choose the property most associated with that considering all the other stuff we've spoken about so and i think you know, i agree 100 percent. also coming back to your strategy so obviously if we're talking sydney yeah properties in the units as an example and houses in the eastern suburbs are quite different than say Parramatta. Um, and we're once again relating back to the point of, of demographic and and i need to stress that we're not just saying that you should go out and buy units or you shouldn't we're just giving the pros and cons and if you're, if I, and if I come back to another pro, if your risk appetite for, for cash flow is at first and foremost, then maybe a yeah six and a half, seven and a half percent yielding townhouse, as an example, um, is the way to go because there's going to be minimal mm. if any negative cash flow to you, and people need as long as all the fundamentals are right. So we're just making that massive assumption, but I think what people need to remember is that the yield 
that a property gives you is almost like a direct reflection of supply and demand. Mm. Yeah, and we're talking about cash flow, therefore the rent. And growth, price growth, usually follows yield. Follows yield. So and if we come back to, say, your property, Phil, in Mount Druitt, the two-bedroom unit in Mount Druitt, which was bought for... 179 I think. 179 and at the time renting for like $260, $270 yeah. a week or whatever it may be. 25 minutes to the CBD of Sydney, opposite Westfields, literally near the train station, near the hospital. The fundamentals are just 100% correct. Mm. There was no reason not to buy that. But off, often the most obvious uh, is not obvious mm. to most people. So if you never touch that unit, and of course you, you did renovate it and so on and so forth, but if you'd never touch that unit, the yield now, the gross yield is somewhere probably around about that seven and a half percent. It's a great performer, and um, you know, talking about that that unit in Mount Druitt, a lot of people live in units in Mount Druitt, so mm, lots of know, people. But you wouldn't buy a two bedroom unit in Burke. No, nothing, no, nothing against Burke. No, you but wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah. So, so, and and running on 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 this point, there's two more things I really want to cover. We're running out of time in this podcast. Um, one is about uh, manufacturing equity, Correct, yeah. uh, houses versus units. We'll have a chat about that. And it's sort of linked with, with mm-hmm. this Mount Druitt scenario using. But another point I would make would be, we're talking about what to buy houses or units, but we need to think about what's better when you sell. And I think a lot of the dynamics that we discussed about are relevant because if you're selling a unit or you're selling a house, you might be selling to an owner occupier or another investor. So you need to make sure that when it's time to get out, that it still suits your portfolio goals. What, what's your sort of comments around that, Victor? Well, uh, I'd, I'd put a different twist to it, uh, Phil, and say that let's, let's uh, and this could be a topic for the later podcasts, uh, we talk about the exit strategy, in other words, paying down the mortgage, mm. you know, retiring the debt. So it comes back to entry cost, right? So your unit townhouse would have a far lower entry cost, so you know, preferably below your 300k mark the ones that we're buying are actually below the 200k mark at the moment uh, they're far easier to pay down than a 350 400k mortgage on a house right so as an entire portfolio you you could probably target a um, one of the mortgages to pay down which would be the units that frees up that rent and then starts you can apply that to to the uh, the freed up rent to a house and that could start paying that out. So it, it, it starts uh, starts that um, uh, effect of uh, you know rapidly paying down your portfolio. That's how I look at it. In the sense that you know your your units have got a purpose uh, in, in in the portfolio, and this is one of the most important purposes is that the ability to pay down that loan, whether it is over a period of time because the rents have gone up uh, significantly, or whether you're forcing it by doing some renovations and sell downs and so forth. And just and just lastly, before we move to the renovation part of it, there are certain units or or townhouses that you should stay away from and Mm. you touched on it a little earlier if you're talking about net cash flow so you should stay away from anything with commercial underneath it so shops Mm. and gyms and restaurants Um, you should stay away from service departments service departments I can attest to that one (laughs) you spoke about that once didn't you just the crappiest investment you could ever have or that I do have so so, yes service departments anything with elevators if you can steer clear of elevators and lifts uh, because they're very costly to repair so you're talking about walk-up units. Then. Walk-up yep. units are, are our boutique blocks. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, it, and and but that's units because mm. townhouses could be could be different. Once again, I actually and some people would cru- crucify me for this, but I depending on where it is, I actually don't mind a swimming pool in the complex mm. uh, as long as it's not heated. So okay, just a yeah. normal in-ground swimming pool with a fence around it and nothing sort of fancy that's going to mm-hmm. have no cost to it. And Queensland's one of those areas. So that adds value so people can take a dip. It adds to the, to the tenant, it does. Not so much to the capital cost, but certainly to the tenant. So you get a few more bucks rent in them because it's got a pool. I think, well, not necessarily you'll get a few more bucks rent, but if supply and demand got out of kilter... It's a point of difference. It's a point of difference, yeah? yeah? And there's okay. no real extra cost to it. But mm. obviously, these are the things you've got to do. So when you buy a unit, you've got to get a strata report amongst everything so that you know the history in terms of expenditure and any proposed expenditure as well. Yeah. So last point that I want to cover before we, we wrap up is um, renovation. So let's call it manufacturing equity. And the we, we spoke very briefly about a property that I have out in Mount Druid. I think you guys have you, you might have properties on the same road yeah. Yeah. by memory. But um, The Golden Mile. The Golden Mile. <laughs> the Golden Mile. What is cheaper to renovate? A house or a unit, and you're going to say it depends, obviously. But oh, look, and, and no, well, it depends. Yeah. It um, <laughs> <laughs> look, every day of the week a unit. There's because there's only so much that can go wrong with a unit. Now this is making sure that the yeah you know, the structural integrity of the whole complex is is, bones is okay. Yeah, the bones are good, yeah. but you got internal for the most internal brick rendered walls, and so. You, you can't do much of that other than paint it, so you can't hurt it. Yep. A bathroom's a bathroom, a kitchen's a kitchen, flooring's flooring, and lights are lights. So it's a very well. How, well, how long did it take us to fully renovate three, yours? Three days. Three well, days. Two and three, a half, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We sort of went in on. I think we did a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 
we did. So we got in on the fright. So so for our listeners, we and check it out on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. We renovated a two-bedroom apartment in yeah it was over a three-day period so we got in on the friday and we're yeah. out by the sunday night and that's making that apartment brand new so we're talking about lights powerpoints kitchens bathrooms floors you, you, the brand lot, new yeah, internally absolutely. so and obviously that was yeah you know, very well organized and a cast of thousands yeah it was well orchestrated or well orchestrated <laughs> it was well orchestrated it, yeah and it, and it was because you know, and that's probably another subject about renovation but units or townhouses are just that much easier to renovate because obviously the the, the square meterage is usually smaller and there's only so many big ticket items you can do whereas a house yeah there's a, a little lot bit more structural uh, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of unit renos you're not really doing big structural you might knock out a bit of a wall or open up something yeah. but you're not doing major structural renovations and, and, and you can do and landscaping and so you've got external and and internal and we've done other renos which have been a whole kit and caboodle including flower exactly. beds and and uh, letter boxes right exactly and i think units or town or units more so than townhouses uh, and villas you can actually budget a little better for your renovations there's mm. not as much that can go wrong once you get into it yeah uh, as opposed to a house the turnover is much much quicker and to be honest with you there's not much it doesn't do your head in in terms of choice and changing the plan, you know, as as you do with a house where you could have a multitude of options a unit. There's only so much you can do to it, so you you're limited by choice, which is a good thing. But but in renovating a unit, you're more limited in your capacity to manufacture more equity. So um, your 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 bracket between unit A and mm-hmm. then unit A plus versus mm-hmm. house A versus house A plus. You can do a lot more with a house to you manufacture can, more. You can add bedrooms the and The potential, and, correct, yeah. is, is, far, is far far better, far greater, but also the cost. But there's well. negatives. That, so you've got, it's a longer renovation, yeah. increasing a lot more expensive in terms of doing the work. Your holding costs are increased. Your insurances may increase. The potential for things to go wrong increases. Absolutely. Uh, so there's a lot of negatives with house renovations versus yeah, unit renovations. Absolutely. Um, both pros and cons. And, I, and I'd probably also say that units have a less maintenance, mm-hmm. ongoing maintenance um, than a house, of course, as well. But yeah, you talk about manufacturing equity or instant equity. Uh, in in units, we've just had some pretty good results down in down in Adelaide, yeah. where we bought um, a, a block of or well, three quarters of a block of two bedroom units that okay. was a deceased estate. They were on an older an older complex, which is as you know, we we love buying the full complexes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the purchase price. Uh, so we bought three bedders for two fifty five. The general public bought two bedders for two fifty five for the same yeah. price. Yeah. And someone just recently in that complex, the, the general public, the handful that were sold and they've just renovated theirs. Um, and on a good renovation, but there's only so far you can go with a two bedroom unit and sold it. Three ten. For yeah. three so ten that's put in, in six months. Yeah, yeah. They settled in July and they've yeah. just resold uh, in November. Um, and that's, you know, pretty much a good renovation and a good equity gain. Yeah. But that's that's once again that's not our client. We're just highlighting here the point mm. that yeah, you can manufacture the equity, but it also comes back to how well you buy it to begin with. Because the renovation, just on that point, is really there to accentuate how well you've bought it at the end of the day mm. and, and tap into its potential. It's good. All right, well, I think we've run out of time, guys. It's, uh, As usual. Really insightful. Yes, it uh, always seems to be the same. Uh, lots of good information there, and I think a lot of food for thought for our listeners. If you've got any other questions or questions related to this topic or anything else in terms of our education series, make sure you write into us, questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. That's questions with an S at rightpropertygroup.com.au. .com.au. Send them through and uh, Steve and Victor will get back to you with uh, some more insight. Uh, I really enjoy this topic. It's it's something which uh, has a lot of moving parts. So you've got the houses versus units, the strategic value of Mm -hmm. either of those different assets and how they fit within the fundamentals of buying property, but also how they fit within your portfolio and where you are at with your portfolio, both in terms of cash flow or capital growth or the number of properties. So there's a lot of different considerations there that you need to be considering. But also the the backside of this conversation has been around uh, the renovations of each of those different assets and how they differ. So in summary, houses are good, units are good, you just got to get the right one in the right place at the Correct. right time. And together is better. And together <laughs> yes. is better. Together is better. And sometimes, and Victor, and, and, and uh, I, I'd stolen this off you uh, many times, but uh, you sp- speak about pigeon pairs sometimes. Mm-hmm. And sometimes a pigeon pair is a house and a unit together. One's getting great capital growth and the other one's offsetting. With a good yield. Yep. Yeah. So it's uh, it, it, that's a really good point, that. And, and I do encourage you to write in to, to Victor on that at questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au and he'll explain that a little bit more to you or give you guys a phone call, I guess. It's, yeah, it's absolutely. Fine. Yeah. All yep. right. That's good. Uh, you can check out the guys at um, 
rightpropertygroup.com.au. You can see what they're up to. And if you're not aware, Stephen Victor, they they do some seminars every Tuesday night, I think. Open forums. Open forums. forums. Yeah, they're open forums. Uh, So they do open forums every Tuesday night in Sydney and you do Melbourne once a month. Once a month. Yeah. So if you need some more information about that and you want to surround yourself with like property-minded investors, I encourage you to get along there. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, We'll be back again next month where we'll cover another topic but if you haven't listened yet make sure you revisit our other episodes that we've covered topic one was 11 things successful property investors don't do topic two was debunking the most popular property myths and number three uh, we spoke about mindset and luckily um if you're not listening to the smart property investment show that i host on a weekly basis uh, where we speak to investors i really enjoy recording uh this education series with the guys at right property group because it allows us to get into a lot of the meat so um check it out and uh, enjoy we'll see you next month bye-bye